Materials used in this presentation are period in nature and used for educational and entertainment purposes. Furthermore, videos have been used in conjunction with the photographs to produce continuity, in some instances are composites, and fall within the purview of the fair use doctrine of U.S. copyright laws. Attributions are given when required. Welcome to A Moment in Crime, a feature vignette presented by the True Crime Man's Dark Imagination YouTube channel. If you've enjoyed this presentation or any other presentation on this channel, please hit like, subscribe, and hit the bell in order to receive notifications on any further offerings on this channel. On February 8, 1955, authorities located the body of a young female named Ermgard Strehl, age 19. Not only had the young lady been stabbed to death, but she had been sexually assaulted and left in a barn in the small town of Ludinghausen, Germany, located in the northwestern part of the country. At the time, police believed that the ferocity of the attack would be an isolated incident. After all, Young girls went missing all the time as they would either run away from home or they would just forget to contact their families or they would wind up as Ermgard, dead. In March 1955, a young girl age 12, known only as Erika Schuletter, is attacked near the Morser Strabite in Rheinweisen, a small district across the Rhine River, also known as Rheinhausen. On June 16, 1959, Clara Frieda Tesmer, age 24, was found in the meadows of the Rhine River Valley where her assailant sexually abused her and then strangled her to death. The assailant left Tesmer's body in almost the exact place as authorities found shoe letter. A little over a month later, Manuela Note's body was found in the city park of Essen, another major Ruhr town. Authorities arrested one Horst Otto who confessed to the murder. After his trial, the court sentenced Otto to eight years in prison. In early 1962, a little girl, Barbara Bruder, age 12, was reported missing from the city of Berscheid, south in the direction of Köln, Germany, and presumed to have been the victim of foul play. On April 23, 1962, Petra Geis is found murdered and assaulted in Dinslaken Bruckhausen. With the Geis murder, police noticed something new about this killer. Parts of Geis's body appeared to have been chewed off. Authorities later determined that Geis had been sexually assaulted at Ries near Valsum, and both of her buttocks had been removed with a knife along with her left forearm and hand. On June 4, 1962, the assailant seemed insatiable after the Geis murder when he attacked 13-year-old Monica Teifel, who vanished on her way to school. Authorities found her body in a field later that day and the body suffered from what can only be described as, quote, stakes carved from her buttocks and the back of her thighs, end quote. On a hot August night in 1965, in Grossenbaum, Germany, a pair of lovers, Hermann and Rita Schmitz, sat in their vehicle kissing, when all of a sudden, Hermann heard what he thought was air escaping from a tire. When he exited the vehicle to investigate further, the unknown assailant stabbed Schmitz to death. Then, the killer focused on Rita, who immediately switched to the driver's seat and tried to run over the assailant. He then fled the area. In Marl, Germany, on September 13, 1966, the assailant, now known as the Ruhr Hunter, brutally murdered one Ursula Rowling, strangling her in Forsterbusch Park in Marl. Rowling's boyfriend, Adolf Schickel, faced false accusations of murdering his girlfriend and later killed himself by drowning in the Mon River in Weisbaden. On December 22, 1966, the assaulter took five-year-old Ilona Hark on a train trip to Wuppertal, Germany, then on a bus to Reimschad or Huxwagen, where they got off the train along the way and walked into a dense part of the forest there. The killer then drowned his young victim and sexually assaulted her subsequently defiling her small body by, quote, slicing steaks from her buttocks and shoulders, end quote. In the following year, 
1967, it appeared that the killer's luck began to run thin. He settled briefly in the German town of Grafenhausen, where he befriended several of the children living there. In one incident, the assailant attempted to lure a 10-year-old girl, Gabrielle Putman, into a nearby field with promises of showing her a white rabbit. Instead, the perpetrator showed her obscene photos in an attempt to arouse the young child. When that didn't work, he began choking her. She broke away from his grip when the local sirens from the coal mine sounded, scaring the attacker and forcing him to flee the area. Had he gotten sloppy with his methods? Perhaps he was taking too many chances, thinking he outsmarted the police time and again, and why would this time be any different? In the coming months and years, the Ruhr Hunter became more brazen, as on July 12, 1969, he entered the home of 61-year-old Maria Hetgen at Huxwagen, Germany, strangling her to death and then sexually abusing her corpse. On May 21, 1970, the attacker ambushed one Jutta Rahn, making her way through the small patch of woods near her house after school. The attacker strangled the young girl to death. Her neighbor-slash-boyfriend, Peter Shea, spent 15 months in jail as being the only suspect in the attack. In 1976, 10-year-old Karen Topfer was assaulted and then strangled to death on her way to school in Dinslaken, Wurt. In July of 1976, four-year-old Marion Kettler proved missing from a local playground and police went searching door-to-door -door for her in Lahr, a Duisburg suburb. At this time, one of the houses they searched, the owners mentioned some very interesting details about a neighbor that lived not too far away. The owner stated that the tenant in one of the apartment flats mentioned to them, either in jest or serious, that his toilet was clogged up with what he called, quote, guts, end quote. When the police investigated further, a plumber summoned by law enforcement unclogged the pipes of the neighbor and found a child's lungs with other organs within the pipes. A medical examiner confirmed the findings. Authorities then became very interested in this seemingly honest person, a man named Joachim Kroll. Detectives went to Kroll's residence, and when first questioned, Kroll stated that the blood and guts that they found were from a rabbit that he killed. But after the authorities confronted him and stated they believed he was lying, he subsequently offered no resistance to their accusations that he had been responsible for the murders of 14 people, or so he could remember. When investigators searched the minuscule man's apartment, what they found both incensed and horrified them. In his freezer, the authorities found bags of what appeared to be human flesh. On the stove, they discovered a tiny hand boiling in a pot with carrots and potatoes. Police also discovered the body of four-year-old Marion Ketter cut into small pieces. On July 3, 1976, authorities arrested Kroll and convinced they finally captured the Ruhr Hunter could not understand how he got away with his vicious crimes for so long. Perhaps it was the fact that several murderers operated at the same time and allowed Kroll to evade capture. Joachim Kroll was born on April 17, 1933, as the son of a miner in Hindenburg, a small principality in Upper Silesia now part of Poland, but at the time of his birth, a portion of Germany. He was the youngest of eight children and possessed the aura of being a very weak child. He often peed in the bed until a late age for that type of behavior, and some historians have strongly speculated that Kroll only possessed an IQ not above 76. Kroll's father, it is said, was involved heavily in World War II as a soldier and later spent time as a prisoner of war in Russia. Perhaps Kroll's lack of a relationship with his father evolved the young boy's affinity to be a weak personality. But then again, Considering the racially pure ideology of the Nazis at the time, Mr. Kroll may not have actively acknowledged a son with mental deficiencies. After the war, the family moved to North Rhine, Westphalia. Even at this time, the family continued to suffer from a lack of food, even more so after the war. This, some have surmised, may have contributed to Kroll's activities as a cannibal. Among the other children, including his other siblings, young Joachim was considered a coward of sorts, so he possessed no loving relationships with them either. Authorities determined that Kroll began murdering after the death of his mother in 1955, perhaps a trigger to more deviant behavior. 
It has never been determined whether Kroll had no more of a relationship with his mother than he did with his father. She passed away and thus began his grisly career. After his capture, Kroll stated that he cut flesh from some of the victims in order to save money on his grocery bill. While in custody, the killer actually believed, after a psychological examination, that he would receive an operation that would finally cure his homicidal tendencies and then see his release from prison. Instead, authorities charged Kroll with eight counts of capital murder and one count of attempted murder. Since the abolition of the death penalty in Germany after World War II, the best that justice could serve on this admitted murderer and cannibal would be life imprisonment. In April of 1982, the court convicted Kroll and sentenced him to terms of life imprisonment. On July 1, 1991, Kroll died of a heart attack in the prison of Rheinbach, Germany, near Bonn. In trying to understand the motives of a killer such as Kroll, one theory involves what other people think about them. Therefore, he or she would conform to the expectation of others. Deviance happens when a detachment occurs from a social bond and stands weakened. To apply this school of thought to Kroll, one must remember that he had a flimsy, if any, relationship with his father growing up. The relationship with his siblings fared no better. Kroll did, however, exhibit some affection for his mother, and it was at her death that this deviant behavior commenced. So, it can be theorized that Mother Kroll's death severed any bonds that kept Kroll from becoming the monster that he had. This, quote, social control theory, end quote, is the best explanation, for the present, that produced the killer known as the Roar Hunter or the Duisburg Maneater. This has been A Moment in Crime. If you've enjoyed this presentation or any other presentation on this channel, please hit like, subscribe, and hit the bell in order to receive notifications on any further offerings on this channel.